Hello, my name is Joe Sosnowski. We are continuing our study of the Word in the Hellenistic world. I've included some contact information for myself. PowerPoint handouts are available for each of these lectures. If you would like one, send me an email and I will email you a copy. Now let's begin with the Holy Spirit prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. The theme for this semester is Judaism in the Hellenistic World. This semester we will study two Maccabees. It's not a continuation of one Maccabees, but a retelling of the story from a different perspective. Both 1 and 2 Maccabees tell the story of the origin of the Jewish feast of Hanukkah, symbolized by the nine candle menorah. 1 Maccabees is as was no, 2 Maccabees is as was 1 Maccabees, one of the seven Catholic Deuterocanonical books. The story takes place during the Hellenistic period. Israel came under Greek rule in 331 when Alexander the Great conquered Israel. When Alexander the Great died in 323, his empire was divided among his generals. The two emerging empires that affected Israel were the Ptolemaic Empire in the south, centered in Egypt, and the Seleucid Empire ruled from the north in Syria. The border between these two competing empires was just north of Israel. At first, the Jews were part of the southern Ptolemaic Empire and were free to practice their faith. But in 198 BC, the Seleucids in the north got control of Israel. The first two Seleucid rulers, Antiochus III and Seleucus IV, continued the practice of allowing the Jews relative freedom to practice their religion. But when the third ruler, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, came into power, he outlawed the practice of the Jewish religion and forced Hellenism on the Jewish people living in Israel. This sparked the Maccabean Revolt, which succeeded, and Israel was independent for 100 years until the year 63 BC, when it was conquered by Rome. One Maccabees focuses on the exploits of the Maccabean dynasty. Its style is historical narrative. The Book of Two Maccabees tells the same story, but from a different perspective. It is set in the early part of the revolution and the exploits of Judas Maccabeus. 2 Maccabees starts with an introduction. In the first part of the introduction, there are two letters written by the Jews in Israel to the Jews in Egypt, encouraging them to observe the Feast of Hanukkah, followed by a prologue where the author of 2 Maccabees explains what and why he is writing the book of 2 Maccabees. He explains that in writing that he is writing an epitome or an abridged version of a larger written history of the Maccabean Revolt versus a tome, which is a larger and scholarly written work. He is writing an abridged version of the five-volume account written by Jason of Cyrene. This five-volume account written by Jason has not been found. Then, in the epilogue, his conclusion, at the end of the book of two Maccabees, he writes, Since Nicanor's doings ended in this way, with the city remaining in possession of the Hebrews from that time on, I will bring my own story to an end here too. If it is well written and to the point, that is what I wanted. If it is poorly done and mediocre, that is the best I could do. Just as it is harmful to drink wine alone or water alone, whereas mixing wine with some water makes a more pleasant drink that increases the light, so a skillfully composed story delights the ears of those who read the work. Let this then be the end. So, he hoped he accomplished his goal, but in any case, he did the best he could. The book focuses on the three military attacks on the temple. The focus of two Maccabees is on the temple, and the style of writing is theological reflection. In the first attack, King Seleucus IV sends his general, Holodorus, to plunder the temple in Jerusalem. And we read what happens in... Chapter 3, verses 24 to 28. But just as he was approaching the treasury with his bodyguards, 
the Lord of spirits who holds all power manifested himself in so striking a way that those who have been bold enough to follow Heliodorus were panic-stricken at God's power and fainted away in terror. There appeared to them a richly capsoned horse mounted by a dreadful rider. Charging furiously, the horse attacked Heliodorus with its front hooves. The rider was seen to be wearing golden armor. Then the two, then two other young men, remarkably strong, strikingly beautiful, and splendidly attired, appeared before him. Standing on each side of him, they flogged him unceasingly until they had given him innumerable blows. Suddenly he fell to the ground, enveloped in great darkness. Men picked him up and laid him on a stretcher. The man, who a moment before had entered the sanctuary with sanctuary and treasury with great retinue, and his whole bodyguard was carried away helpless, having dearly experienced the sovereign power of God. So the temple is saved by direct divine intervention. The second attack is by King Antiochus IV. The story begins with Jason bribing his way into the office of high priest from the king and Jason's efforts to embrace Hellenism. And we read in chapter 4 verse 10, When Jason received the king's approval and came into office, he immediately initiated his countrymen into the Greek way of life. Jason wanted Hellenism, and he got much more Hellenism than he asked for or probably expected, because Antiochus IV mandates Hellenism. He outlaws the practice of Judaism, and he profanes the temple, all of which sparked passive resistance. People who accept martyrdom for the faith. We will read the stories of the martyrdom of the old man Eleazar and the mother and her seven sons. Eleazar chose death rather than violate the Jewish law. He says, I will prove myself worthy of my old age, and I will leave to the young a noble example of how to die willingly and generously for the revered and holy laws. And then there is the story of the martyrdom of the mother and her seven sons who were all tortured and killed. After six had been tortured and killed, and it came down to the seventh and the youngest and final son, he says, Like my brothers, I offer my body and my life. Through me and my brothers, may there be an end to the wrath of the Almighty that has justly fallen on our whole nation. He sees himself as offering his life in reparation for the sins of his people. These stories were inspirations for the early Christian martyrs. These stories of martyrdom are followed by the story of Judas Maccabeus, who takes active military resistance. He retakes, purifies, and rededicates the temple. The third attack is under Antiochus V, who was unsuccessful, and the book ends with Judas Maccabeus' victory over the next king, King Demetrius' is General Nicanor. The theology of the book is the theology of retribution. Obedience leads to blessings, and disobedience leads to curses. The book starts with the Jews being obedient and blessed. The Jews are living faithfully and in peace under the good high priest Onias. We read in chapter 3, verse 1, While the holy city lived in perfect peace and the laws were strictly observed because of the piety of the high priest Onias and his hatred of evil, their obedience results in the blessings of peace. The disobedience began with the bad high priest Jason who embraces Hellenism. God uses the Seleucid kings, especially Antiochus IV, to punish the Jews for embracing Hellenism and turning their back on their faith. This sparks resistance from those who want to remain faithful. The obedience of Judas who engages in active military resistance and the obedience of those who resist passively by accepting martyrdom for the faith Obedience, both active and passive, turns things around, and God restores the blessings. Some theological points. In the story of, in the story of the mother and her seven sons, we have the idea of the bodily resurrection of the dead and the idea of innocent, redemptive suffering. In the story of the battlefield dead, after the battle, Judas Maccabeus went to gather up the dead bodies of his fallen soldiers. He found that some of them were wearing amulets sacred to idols. They were guilty of idolatry. 
and we read that Judas and his soldiers prayed for them and sent an offering to Jerusalem so an offering could be made for them for their sins. And we read in chapter 12, verse 43 to 44, and then, cha- and then verse 46, we read, He then took up a collection among all his soldiers, amounting to 2,000 silver drachmas, which he sent to Jerusalem to, prov- to provide for an expiatory offering. In doing this, he acted in a very excellent and noble way, inasmuch as he had the resurrection of the dead in view, for if he were not expecting the fallen to rise again, it would have been useless and foolish to pray for them in death. Thus he made atonement for the dead, that they might be freed from their sin. So in this story, we have the theology of the resurrection of the dead, praying for the dead, and a basis for the Catholic understanding of purgatory, that those who died in sin still need to be freed from their sins, and we on earth can help. And then the story of Judas's dream, he sees Onias, the faithful high priest, and the prophet Jeremiah, both of whom were dead, praying for the Jewish community. This is part of the basis for the theology of the saints in heaven praying and interceding for us here on earth. The book of 2 Maccabees ends with the words, Let this then be the end, and so now let this be the end of my lecture. Next week, lecture 7 will be on the book of Judah. Let's finish with an Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.